started. Sure, why ahead. not? All right. Well, on behalf of the Greater Nashua Chamber of Commerce and its Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome all the attendees and, uh, and the legislators to our uh, crossover coffee and conversation. Uh, hopefully next year, we will be able to hold this in person with a cocktail in our hand instead of a cup of coffee. Uh, for those on the call or on the, on the Zoom that um, aren't familiar exactly with what crossover is, um, I'd like to remind members that it is literally when all the bills that have been introduced in each chamber, the House and the Senate, and have gone through committee and have been passed by the chamber, that chamber, and will now cross over to the other chamber, the House and the Senate. Those that have been killed or held on to in committee will not cross over. Um, crossover date uh, for all the various reasons that COVID, uh, unique circumstances that COVID has created uh, has kind of pushed crossover off a little bit. So we're a little bit ahead of the game, but uh, it's still good to have a conversation about the various topics that we're facing right now. Uh, many bills were retained, basically put off to try and save time as they've not been able to meet regularly. Thus, there will be fewer bills in the second half than usual for the Senate. It is a budget year and a budget is a very top priority. Um, but the Senate bills that have had financial impacts or appropriations have largely been tabled as so they will go into the budget. Uh, we're going to have a few speakers on this morning and there will be an opportunity for Q&A after each speaker. So please submit your questions in the chat box and um, I'll try and pay attention to that and, and raise those as we can. So now on behalf of the Board of Directors, I am pleased to introduce for the first time at a Chamber event, our new CEO, Wendy Hunt. Wendy? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Brian. Uh, little housekeeping for the speakers coming up. Um, to my left, maybe not y'all's left, is Nathan Frankiller. He is our marketing director and he is my IT guy this morning. So as we ask questions um, of the speakers and the speakers will be spotlighted, there may be a little delay in switching back and forth. So if you can wait until you see your face before you quit, before you start speaking, that would be awesome. Um, I wanted to thank our sponsors this morning. Uh, this event is made possible by their generosity. Our presenting sponsor is BAE Systems, which has graciously sponsored this event for many years. As our city's largest employer, um, business issues are obviously a great concern to BAE and they have long taken an active role in helping shape positive business policies for New Hampshire and on behalf of the chamber, special thanks to BAE and especially Tom Bishop, Director of Government Affairs at BAE. I'd also like to thank Eversource, another longtime sponsor, active with the chamber in many events, including a sustaining sponsor of today's event. Energy remains a top issue for New Hampshire businesses and Eversource has played a leading role in providing accurate, timely information to help shape energy public policy in the state. On behalf of the chamber, Special thanks to Eversource, uh, Donna Gamash, Director of Government Affairs and one of today's speakers, and to Will Craig, Government Affairs Manager at Eversource, who also sits on the Chamber Board of Directors. New to today's event, but obviously playing a very active role in advocacy with us at the Chamber is Credit Strategies, which untangles issues and gives us guidance and deep knowledge as to what is happening up at the State House and impacts the business climate. Special thanks to the New Hampshire Senior Policy Advisors, who just happen to be former New Hampshire State legislators themselves, Peter Bragdon and Peggy Gilmore. And to round out today's list of event sponsors, thank you to our contributing sponsors, Baker, Newman, and Noyes. Now it's my distinct privilege to introduce National Mayor Jim Donches. Well, thank you for having me as usual. And I first want to welcome Wendy to Nashua. I know you did a great job over in the Sauhegan Valley. So this mm -hmm. This is uh, nice to see you for the first time. And I wanna say that I'm glad uh, to meet, all, meet with all of our legislators uh, from the region. Uh, we try to work together to promote the interests of this region. Sometimes I think the, some people in Concord forget that Nashua Manchester region generates 35% of the state's economy. So steps at the state level, which help us strengthen our job base and our economy, help the entire state of New Hampshire. And uh, of course, from a city perspective, I can't help but say that uh, as I talk with mayors around the state and we meet periodically, the 
top concern this time is the additional costs in terms of reduced revenue, school aid particularly, and uh, the pension increase that are hitting the taxpayers uh, very hard across the state of New Hampshire. Uh, that has to be one of our top concerns. But I, um, I'm just glad to be here. Glad to see that uh, Wendy has joined us. And if anybody ever needs anything, uh, please, from the city or from Nashua, please don't hesitate to uh, contact me or any of the other uh, members of the Board of Aldermen who also happen to be on the legislature. Thank you, Jim. Now it's my distinct pleasure to also introduce all of the legislators with us today. If you could let us know uh, what area you represent and what committee you're on, uh, that would be great. We're gonna keep you in gallery view just for purposes of simplicity and time. I'm gonna start with Senator Chuck Morris. Hi, I'm Senate President Chuck Morris. I represent um, Salem, Plastow, Pelham and Atkinson. Thank you, Senator Donna Susi. Good morning, I'm Senator Donna Susi. I represent five wards in the city of Manchester in the town of Litchfield and I'm the Democratic leader in the Senate. Senator Kevin Avard. All right, we'll come back to him. Senator Gary Daniels. That's Senator Gary Daniels. I represent Amherst, Merrimack, Milford and Wilton. I serve as chair of Senate finance and I'm also on ways and means and capital budget. Thank you. Senator Cindy Rosenwald. Is she with us this morning? Representative Tom Lanzara. Representative Martin Jack. Yeah, I'm, uh, I represent uh, National Ward 9 and on, on Public Works and Highways. Representative Latha Mang Mangipudi. Namaste to all. I represent Ward 8 in Nashua and I serve on municipal and county government. Representative Laura Teller Tellerski. Good morning. I represent Hillsborough 35, which is Nashua Ward 8, and I am the deputy ranking member of transportation. Representative Catherine Sophakaitis. Well, you guys got some not so easy names for 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> That's diversity for you in Nashua. Exactly. Is Catherine here? Representative Esta, Estathea Boris. Representative Pham Nutter Upham. Good morning, Fran Nutter Upham. I represent Ward 6 and I serve on Health and Human Services and Elder Affairs. Representative Michael Peterson. Hi, uh, Michael Peterson, Hillsborough 32, Nashua Ward 5. I sit on the Public Works and Highways Committee. Representative Sherry Duxie. Hi, I'm Sherry Dutsey. I represent Ward 3 and I'm, in, I'm on the Environment and Agriculture Committee. Representative Suzanne Vail. Representative Patricia Klee. Good morning. Um, I represent uh, Ward 3, which is Hillsborough District 30. I uh, sit on the municipal and county government um, committee. Representative Jan Sch Schmidt. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm from Ward 1 and I'm in the labor committee. Representative Bruce Cohen. Representative Maria Perez.
Representative Megan Murray. Good morning. I represent the town of Amherst and I'm the deputy ranking member on environment and agriculture. Representative Maureen Mooney. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maureen Mooney. I represent the town of Merrimack, which is Hillsborough District 21. I serve on the election law committee. I'm a co-chair of the speaker's advisory group, an <clears throat> assistant majority whip, and serve on the commission of the health effects of perfluorinated chemicals, uh, which I hope is mentioned today regarding our water issues here in the town of Merrimack and surrounding area. Thank you, and again, good morning. Thank you. Representative David Cody. Representative Kat McGee. Everyone. Uh, I represent Hillsborough 27, which is Hollis, and I'm deputy ranking member on science, technology, and energy. Thank you very much. And I apologize for some name pronunciation, pronunciation so early this morning. Um, I also had a very difficult uh, maiden name. So I, I understand when, when mispronunciations happen, it's not fun. Um, I would now like to introduce Peggy Gilmore of Pretty Strategies. Peggy. Oh, thanks, Wendy, and thanks everybody for being here. We're really pleased to have our uh, legislative colleagues and particularly Senate leadership with uh, Senator Susi and Senator Morse and uh, Senator Daniels who have joined in. But uh, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Senate President Chuck Morse. Uh, Senate President Morse has a long legislative history. He served as Senate President from uh, 2013 to 2018 and is now back in that role. And you know, we know that Senator Morse knows all things budget. It's uh, something that he's delved into over the years. And as a business owner, he's keenly aware of the issues that impact business businesses. So it gives him a great perspective on uh, business issues and employees, what they face. Um, the Senate won't officially receive House Bill 1 and House Bill 2 until later this week, but I know that Senator Morse and Senator Daniels, as chair of the Senate Finance Committee, have certainly formulated the principles that will make up the Senate budget. Um, and so we're really pleased to have Senator Morse give us those principles and the highlights of what he expects and what he expects to be able to do with the budget and what we're, the product that hopefully we're going to end up with. Uh, as Wendy said, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Uh, she and Brian will monitor and send them off to Senator Morse and Senator Daniels at the end of their presentation. Senator Morse, you're on to help us understand. Peggy, it's great to see you. And I want to thank the Nashville Chamber for this opportunity. Um, you know, to have three Senate presidents on a call at the same time. Um, uh, thank you, Senator Bragdon, for giving me the invitation to be here. And Senator Susi, it's great to see you on a Monday morning. So um, I'm, as I said before, I, I represent um, part of the Southern tier. So I certainly represent a district that is a lot like Nashua dealing with the border communities. Um, I think I have a pretty good understanding of um, how the state functions down on the southern tier. Um, and I, as we grow with the budget, I think you'll see that the uh, Senate certainly will have an understanding of the whole state of New Hampshire. But uh, it's been a privilege this year. I'm working with 23 people and uh, you have two of the finest um, in Nashua, uh, Senator Rosenwald and Senator Avard, uh, just two great people that truly care about the state of New Hampshire. And, and I think you'll see that as we go through the budget phase because um, the Senate has a way of doing things with the budget. Um, and a lot of what we've passed in the Senate is sitting on the table in the Senate waiting to go into the budget when the House sends it over to us. So I think you'll see what the Senate's um, believing in and, and where they believe the state needs to go. Um, I think there's, there's plenty of opportunity coming up um, between what's happening federally and what's happening um, in the state of New Hampshire. And you're gonna see that as the Senate starts to work through the budget phase. But um, this has been a challenging year. Um, I don't think anyone anticipated how we ended the year last year where we um, did things virtually that we'd be coming back and starting the session with committee meetings and with sessions being virtual. Um, 
you know, it's that relationship between 23 senators that's made it work. Um, Senator Nsusi and Senator Bradley have been great teammates on making sure we prep everyone so that when we go into a session, we can actually get through it and the public can understand what we're trying to accomplish. Um, if, if it seems like it's easy on, on the outside, um, it's not. It takes a whole day to prep um, to go into a session day to make sure amendments are ready ahead of time. Um, I was joking the other day that, you know, we had an amendment coming forward and usually we have pages hand them out and, you know, it's, it gives us a break for a minute or two. Um, it, that doesn't happen anymore. We, they have all this in a box waiting for them. Um, and if anyone comes up with something new, uh, the Senate has to take a break in order to deal with that. And we, uh, we seem to be able to handle it. I, I don't want to go too much longer, but we're waiting for the governor um, to open up the state. And then I think you'll see the Senate come back into um, meeting in the state house. Unfortunately, I don't believe you're going to be invited into the state house this whole session that we're having right now. I think we'll uh, just have legislators um, as we move forward, but um, we're looking forward to that. Hey, speaking to a chamber is just a, a great thing because I, I, I think where the Senate's headed. Um, we're concerned about Main Street businesses. We're concerned about tax models. I, I, I certainly think that as we go forward, you're gonna see that in the Senate's budget. Um, we're gonna work to make sure that you can thrive in this economy because right now I'm a small business owner. I, I own a nursery and garden center and um, things are booming. Um, but we're concerned about 23, 24, 25, to make sure the state can attract new businesses and expand the ones that are here. So those are the things that I think you'll see as the Senate prepares its budget. And the, um, you know, I think the fiscal discipline that you've seen in the budget to date um, is going to allow the Senate to work with what's coming forward. I mean, we were able to see March 15th um, revenue results, but the Senate also gets the benefit of seeing April 15th results. And I think that, you know, has always made it easier for the Senate to adjust to problems, whether it be education or mental health. Um, we certainly have a lot of challenges that we have to deal with. And, you know, when the House budget gets over, um, the Senate will put their spin on it. And, the, uh, you know, we don't have a division one, two and three, but we, we certainly uh, go through a process with Senator Daniels that is similar to division one, two, and three. And, um, you know, healthcare being three in the house, um, the Senate's certainly concerned about a $75 million back of the budget cut that the house has right now, um, because we want to define that. And I think as we go forward, we will. And the, um, you'll see that when we put our process together. Um, I'm ready to take questions. It's a Monday morning. So I'm just, uh, getting going. I, uh, I start my business at four o'clock in the morning. So um, I'm waking up to you guys um, after I've already unloaded a truck of trees. So I'm ready to go. I don't see any questions in the, qu uh, in the um, chat room yet, um, Senator. So, oh, here we go. Uh, how do you see public? How do you see public and businesses? It looks like that question was cut off. Lassa, do you want to um, unmute yourself and ask that question? Yes, Senator, good morning. Uh, thank you for laying out uh, how Senate is functioning. How do you see uh, this going forward, this session? How do you see the public and businesses participate uh, virtually while the legislators are in person in the state house? Well, I, I you know, Personally, and I, I think you'll hear from Senator Susi, and, and uh, I met with Senator Susi and Senator Bradley um, on Friday. Um, we certainly believe as a legislature, we need to get together. Um, it just works better that way. 24 senators, whether Republican or Democrat, they talk to each other and they solve problems. So I think we need to get back to that. Um, not that that doesn't happen virtually. It just seems some people like to talk a little bit more virtually than you know others, and, and it it, it kind of limits how our days go. So um, we're working through that. As for the public, 
I don't think there's been any lack of communication um, with the public um, between cell phones and computers. Um, I actually think it's opened up communication in New Hampshire. Um, maybe not the best because, um, you know, people will definitely tell you how they feel on a computer when you're talking together. I think it's a little more respectful, but um, we're getting through it. And I, I think we're looking for the state of New Hampshire to open up so that we can have those meetings um, in person. Thank you, Senator. One of the things you mentioned was um, <clears throat> how this year, maybe more so than normally, the, f the federal government may play a big role and the money will get um, can you touch on that and how that, you know, how that at this point is influencing your thought process? Well, I think the, you know, there's several things going on in Washington and, you know, we're tracking them the best we can as a state, but the, the first money that's going to come is, is it could be in the bank today, to be honest with you. Um, you know, there's about a billion dollars that the state's going to be able to deal with directly and then the cities had another chunk of money that were going directly to the cities. Uh, I think you were getting 17 million in, in Nashua. And then I think the, there's money going to all the towns. Um, the billion dollars is where I think the legislature will have a big influence. Um, water, sewer um, are certainly uh, things that we're talking about um, solving problems with. Uh, we do realize there'll be some kind of infrastructure bill coming out of Washington that'll add to that. But um, I think those are two of the main topics. You'll certainly see things about roads. I think you'll see, you know, an expansion of um, cable throughout the state of New Hampshire to make sure everybody has access. And the, uh, <coughs> the great thing about all these things, as we have time to research them, um, there's other buckets of money that are tying to them federally that I think New Hampshire is gonna to have to pay attention to so that a billion turns into 2 billion. I think we're very good at that as a state. And I think we have to make that all happen if we're gonna solve a lot of problems. Uh, Representative McGee, thank, thank, you. thank you, Senator. Representative McGee, you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, Senator, how are you? Great. Good. Um, we had a bill, uh, I guess, that was um, stopped on our side of the house for 5% uh, contribution from the state on the New Hampshire retirement system. And I know that this has been something for municipalities, you know, are concerned with for some time. And apparently contributions are going up. So, you know, it has that local impact. Um, my understanding was that Senator Rosenwald had a bill that also requested a contribution from the state I think of 15%, ours was five. So I wondered if you could say anything about whether you foresee anything happening uh, on the Senate side this time around to affect the New Hampshire retirement system payments? No, I, I, I personally don't believe the state should get back into that. Governor Lynch um, made that decision. Um, I was finance chair back then and took the state out of um, you know, being in that process. But I also don't think the legislature should be passing any legislation that pushes down expenses when it comes to that, um, which we did in the last session. And I don't believe that's right because then that gives, you know, the communities the ability to come back up and say, it's you driving things up. Um, we have very little control over decisions that are made locally um, on driving up the retirement system. But the reality is we shouldn't be passing legislation in Concord that forces anything to go out locally. I, I, we've done a lot of work on that in the past, and I think the legislature should stay out of it, and I don't think we should go back into funding it. Now, I do believe there's a lot of other ways that we should go back into funding. Um, we're certainly looking, Senate Bill 99, which is a bill that we're gonna send money back to the communities from the rooms and meals tax. Um, we should be looking at that. Senator D'Alessandro has a piece of legislation that I put on the table that basically would send money directly back to the communities. Um, I think we should be looking at those, but um, they've been written a specific way in Senator D'Alessandro's case. He certainly wants to make sure that it's sent back to the communities to lower taxes, um, not create additional expenses, but you're gonna have a plenty of opportunity locally to deal with expenses with the formulas that I think are gonna come out of 
what money's coming into the state of New Hampshire, um, I think the, the whole state will be able to solve a lot of problems as we get through this budget phase. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Wendy, I think we're ready to move on to the next part of the agenda, if you'd like. Okay, I'll, I'll pick it up, Ryan. Oh, great, Peggy, uh, go right ahead. Thanks, Senator Morse, for that um, thanks, helpful. Um, our next speaker is Jim Osiglio. Now, Jim is somebody who sits on the Chamber Advocacy Committee, but in his real job, his day job, Jim, um, as a CPA and with a lot of other certifications, is a principal at Baker Newman and Noyes, at one of New Hampshire and New England's major accounting and financial advisory firms. You know, Jim understands in a way that not many do, uh, New Hampshire tax law, the implication of changes on individuals and businesses. Uh, and you know those people who hire him to keep them in good stead with both their dollars and with the IRS. And, uh, that's a good thing. The chamber's in good stead to have Jim look at tax related legislation that's coming forward this year and how it will impact the businesses, uh, the people we rep you represent and, and the people you are in our business community. Uh, remember again, questions in the chat, Jim? Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, looks like am I, I am all set. Okay, there we go. I'm glad that everyone can join us. And so as Peggy said, I'm gonna be providing an update on the New Hampshire um, tax legislation that has been moving through Concord this past session. Um, but I'm gonna take a moment since I have everyone kind of captive um, as I thought about it this morning, just a reminder that New Hampshire's tax deadline, filing tax deadline is next week. And so if you haven't yet filed your tax returns, either a sole proprietorship, corporate, um, or the interest in dividends tax, those are all still due April 15th. As you may know, the federal or the IRS changed its filing deadline to May 17th. Um, but unfortunately, New Hampshire is still April 15th. So if you haven't yet filed your return or extension, you may wanna do that again um, over the next week. So um, with that said, first I wanted to mention some of the basic tenets that the chamber um, considers when we look at proposed tax legislation, whether either to support it or to oppose it. And those could be things such as what is the impact to a business's costs, including its taxes? Will the legislation be an incentive for businesses to come to New Hampshire and to expand here? and also whether the legislation will create or inhibit job growth and retention. And so I would say this past session or the sessions that's ongoing now has been pretty favorable with regards to New Hampshire tax legislation. Um, and the list that I'm gonna go through, I think would support that. And excuse me, I'd also reach out back to Peggy and Peter that if you want to jump in at any point in time on any update on the legislation that I'm gonna go through, please feel free to do that. So let me start off with what I would say is the most, um, uh, the biggest, I guess, item on my radar, and I think on many businesses, is the PPP forgiveness issue. And so PPP stands for Paycheck Protection Program, and I'm, probably most folks are familiar with that program. Um, again, it came out of the CARES Act, which really was needed for most businesses or a lot of businesses to kind of be a lifeline. And so federal law provides that loan amounts received by taxpayers from federal PPP loans that are forgiven are not includable in taxable income. And so those businesses that have gotten these PPP loans to help um, you know, retain their employees, when those loans are forgiven, those loan amounts are not taxable under federal law. However, under New Hampshire's PPT statute, those forgiven PPP loan amounts are includable in taxable income for BPT purposes. And so many states have mirrored the federal tax law and will not tax those amounts, but New Hampshire um, and their current law for different reasons is taxing those amounts. And so I can say from kind of a practical point of view, most businesses that I work with haven't yet had their PPP loans forgiven. It's really gonna be a 2021 event. 
but there have been some businesses that have had their loans forgiven in 2020, which means that those returns for 2020 are due now. And so it's put those businesses in a very high spot, not knowing whether if they had their loans forgiven last year, whether those forgiven loan amounts are gonna be taxable or not. And so they're all waiting, um, you know, as we speak to find out what's going on with those amounts. Um, Senate Bill 3 would amend the BBT statute so that New Hampshire's treatment of forgiven PPP loan amounts mirrors the federal tax treatment and therefore would not be included in taxable income for BBT purposes. And Senate Bill 3 um, passed unanimously in the Senate and is currently in the House. And so hopefully that you know, Senate bill goes through and can provide relief for the New Hampshire businesses that have forgiveness. Again, in 2020, that's like a, an, an item that we kind of need to know right now because currently those forgiven amounts are gonna be in the BPT. And those amounts can, as you know, can be small or it can be a very large amount. And so that's probably the biggest item that I'm seeing um, whether that PPP is gonna be taxable in New Hampshire or not. The next area I would say on our radar is business taxes generally. And so I think, as you may know, the BBT tax rate is at 7.7% and the BET tax rate is 0.6. And again, for those not familiar with the BET tax, it's a tax which is assessed on the amount of compensation, interest and dividends paid. Meaning um, if, if a company doesn't have any profit, it's still gonna be subject to this alternative tax, this BET tax. And again, that's at 0.6%. And so because of certain revenues collected for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2020, um, a trigger which is in the current law was not, um, well, a tax rate trigger was not met. And so if revenues went above or below a certain percentage, the rates were either gonna go up or down, neither one happened. And so the tax rate currently is 7.7 .7 BPT and BET is 0.6. There's been various bills to decrease the BBT rate to 7.5% and the BET tax rate down to 0.5% over two years. Those bills have been tabled or retained as it's very likely that some reduction in the BBT and or BET tax rates will be seen in the final budget. And they are currently in the House budget. The governor's proposed budget also reduces the BET tax rate from 0.6 down to 0.55, but does not mention reducing the BBT tax rate. And just so for some context, the Tax Foundation, which is a leading independent tax policy nonprofit, puts out an annual, um, I guess, a, ta a tax climate survey. And for 2021, New Hampshire's ranking for the overall ranking, which would include um, our tax burden in regards to sales taxes, income taxes, business taxes, property taxes. Overall, we come in very high at number six. But strictly speaking on the business corporate tax rank alone, we still come in very low. We're at um, number um, 43. Actually, no, we're at number 41. So we climbed a little bit. We were at 43 and now we're at 40 frost. And so we have still a long way to go with regards to the business tax um, climate. The governor's proposed budget and the house budget also both reduce the rate of and eventually eliminate the interest and dividends tax over a five year period. So besides the business taxes um, that are proposed to come down, the IND tax, which as you may know, is a 5% tax on interest and dividends. Again, there's also um, in the proposed governor's proposed budget and the house budget, a reduction in the eventual elimination of that tax as well. And also somewhat interestingly, I would say is that the governor's proposed budget and the house budget both limit the amount of BPT and BET overpayment that can be carried forward as a credit with the remainder of the overpayment being refunded, which reduces the amount that the state has to book as a potential liability against the state's revenues for credit carryovers from overpaid taxes. And so in other words, if a company were to file a BBT tax return and their tax liability, you can pick a number, but say it's $10,000 and they had a large overpayment of $30,000, um, for various reasons, a business may wanna just apply that $30,000 overpayment to their business tax return for the following year. So again, their tax is $10,000, they have a $30,000 overpayment. They may just wanna apply it all for next year. Again, it could be different reasons. Maybe they have a big tax event coming up or whatnot. So this legislation um, seemingly would 
limit that amount that can be applied to their tax return for the next year um, over a period of time. So I think in 2027, um, under the House budget, the maximum amount that could be applied would be 100% of their tax liability. So in my example, if they had a $30,000 overpayment, the most that they could apply would be $10,000 and then the rest would have to be refunded. So again, somewhat interesting um, that that's in both of the budgets, um, but again, just something to watch. Um, also, we have changes in thresholds. And so I would say that this is really most importantly to small businesses in the state of New Hampshire. So I think a lot of you may know, um, again, two taxes, BPT and BET. So under our, our current law, BPT, the filing threshold is gross business income in excess of $50,000. And for BET, we have two filing thresholds, either gross receipts in excess of $222,000 or a BET tax base greater than $111,000. And again, the tax base consists of the amount of compensation, interest, and dividends paid. Again, so um, you could have a company that um, doesn't meet the gross receipts test or has a loss. Again, if it has a base of greater than $111,000 based on compensation, interest, and dividends, it would have to file a tax return. Both the governor's proposed budget and the house budget raise both of the BET filing thresholds to $250,000 while Senate Bill 101, which passed unanimously in the Senate and is currently in the House, would increase the BPT gross business income filing threshold from 50,000 to 75,000, which happens to be the same amount as the reasonable compensation safe harbor deduction. And so it does appear very likely that an increase in the BPT and or BET filing threshold will be seen in the final budget. So again, I'd say overall, it's good news for both tax rates and the filing thresholds, especially for the smaller businesses in New Hampshire. Um, so that's all very favorable. Another item on our list um, is the single sales factor apportionment. And so just to step back, um, for businesses that just file in New Hampshire, this wouldn't be an issue. Because if a business just files in New Hampshire, it wouldn't quote apportion its income, it just files a tax return in the state of New Hampshire. But for those businesses that do business in and out of the state of New Hampshire and have to therefore apportion their income, meaning if a business in Ashua does some business in Massachusetts and is subject to mass tax, they not only are subject to uh, New Hampshire tax, but mass tax. And so they have to kind of divvy up their income and apportion it between the two states. And so every state has its own apportionment factor, the way you do that. Under current law, uh, well, I should say under New Hampshire current law, a business apportions its gross business um, profits on the basis of three factors, property, payroll, and a double weighted sales factor. So meaning if a company has $100,000 or, or, or a million dollars, it apportions that using these three factors, how much property they have in the state, how much payroll they have in the state, and a double weighted sales, meaning how much um, sales are in the state. And so um, let me just keep going on. N next year, effective um, for tax years ending out on or after December 31st, 2022, under current law, a business will start apportioning its gross business profits using only a single sales factor. So accordingly, the taxable business profits subject to New Hampshire tax will be determined by multiplying their gross business profits by the single sales factor, which is the ratio of New Hampshire sales to overall sales. And so the single sales factor is generally considered to be advantageous for businesses with significant property and payroll in New Hampshire, since single sales apportionment is based solely on the apportionment of um, businesses sales occurring in New Hampshire and not the amount of property or payroll in the state. And so if you just step back and think about it, if a business has all of its property in New Hampshire and all of its payroll in New Hampshire and some percentage of sales in New Hampshire, if you do that math, their property um, apportionment would be 100%, their payroll factor would be 100% and say 50% of their sales are in um, New Hampshire. And so when you do that math, you can just kind of intuitively without even crunching the numbers, you know, Feel that that's going to be a heavy number because all their property and payroll in the state and maybe half their sales are in the state so their apportionment percentage is going to come out kind of on the top heavy side 75 percent in my example when we move as a as it is currently scheduled to the single sales factor apportionment for next year all it is is a look at their sales in new hampshire and so in my example of 50 percent of their sales are in new hampshire all of a sudden their apportionment comes down to 50 percent and so it's really um, meant to lessen the tax burden on New Hampshire-based businesses and increase it on those businesses based out of state. 
And so that's what's, again, for 2021, as you may know, we are going to be using market-based sourcing. 2022, we're going to be moving to the single sales factor apportionment. Now, there was a bill to delay the implementation of the single sales factor apportionment for four years until 2026, House Bill 281. That bill was killed in the Senate 24 to 0. However, the House budget writers have inserted the text of that bill into the House budget. And so now it becomes part of the budget negotiations with the Senate. It seems very likely it, um, that the Senate version of the budget will not contain that language. Um, really something to kind of watch. Um, again, but as it is uh, in the current law, 2022, we are moving to single sales factor apportionment, again, unless, um, unless there's legislation to delay that. Okay, the next item I wanted to touch upon was meals and rooms tax. Um, two items under the meals and rooms tax to bring to your attention. One would be a temporary increase in the amount of meals and rooms tax revenues on taxable meals that an operator would be allowed to retain as a commission for co collecting it. So Senate Bill 128, which is known as the Restaurant Relief Act of 2021 and sponsored by Nashua Senator Rosenwald, would increase the amount retained by operators who sell taxable meals from 3% to 5% of the taxes due for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2022. It's basically, it's getting a little bit more money back to the restaurants, even if it's for one year. Um, although the bill was tabled in the Senate, it's possible that a temporary increase in the operator's commission for meals and rooms tax will be seen in the final budget, but that remains unclear. Another item in the meals and rooms tax area is the governor's proposed budget and the House version of the budget both reduced the meals and rooms tax from 9% to 8.5%. So I think as we all know, the hospitality industry, the hotels, restaurants were really hit hard by COVID-19. And so again, two pieces of legislation that um, would help that industry. And the last item I just wanted to mention was a bill that would potentially um, reduce New Hampshire's research and development tax credit budget. And so New Hampshire has a research and development tax credit program, which provides bus a business tax credit for qualified research and development expenses. So this program has been widely um, successful. Usually the applications far exceed the amount of the budget. It's really meant to bring businesses, um, research and development type businesses to New Hampshire. Um, again, I would say it's been wildly successful. Under current law, the total aggregate amount of research and development tax credits that can be used against business taxes for any fiscal year cannot exceed $7 million. House Bill 210 would decrease the aggregate amount from $7 million down to $2 million for any fiscal year while increasing exemptions under the IND tax. This bill was retained in the House but not killed. It's anticipated that the bill will be taken up again by the House in September and will likely not appear in the budget. So, again, um, it may not have been killed, but just something to um, that we'll be watching closely. Um, again, as it, I guess, as it could be taking up again in the House later this year. And so, again, I would say overall, a very favorable tax legislation, especially during this time um, that a lot of businesses are, are still struggling and trying to um, hopefully turn the corner as we get through this. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, so it looks like Wendy sent out a, uh, Wendy, did you want to mention what you just sent out? Um, thank you, Jim. I, yes, I went ahead and put it into the chat so you would have the registration link, but we are offering a business education webinar. It's free. So if you want to share the link, uh, it, anyone is invited to discuss the um, employee retention tax credit, which, um, is going to be a very important tax break for our employers. That's Thank all I you, have, Wendy. Jim. Nope. So I think that's all I had. Um, happy to answer any questions either now or later. Uh, let's see, uh, Representative Madden, can you speak to the status of the lawsuit with Massachusetts concerning taxing income of New Hampshire residents working in New Hampshire, but are are employees of a Massachusetts based company. Yeah, so this is a um, hot issue as well. I don't, I can't, I haven't seen anything honestly on that lawsuit. I know that's out there. Um, 
I know Massachusetts has continued to put out legislation, not legislation guidance, saying that, um, you know, what their position is and why they are taking the position to tax that income. Uh, again, that they've cited from what I can remember, other states doing the same thing. Um, again, I, I can't really speak to the status. I, I guess my advice at this point would be um, probably um, file an extension, I suppose, but I'm not convinced, honestly, I'm not convinced that they're gonna change anything. And so I think it's really gonna be coming down to, um, uh, like you said, a legal matter. Uh, again, every state kind of has its own tax laws and that's the position that they're taking. Okay, Lassa, I'm not ex exactly sure of your question. Do you wanna ask the question? Yes, I, it, for some reason, auto correction is killing me. <laughs> I get it. Yes, um, I guess it's having a problem understanding me, whatever. Uh, thank you for taking my question. As a business uh, leaders, and you know, you laid out the BPT, BET, and all the tax implications for the, doing business in New Hampshire. How do you see what the federal low, you know, funds coming in because of COVID, how it's helping or hindering um, growth and successes of businesses in New Hampshire? I would say from what I've seen, it's been critical. Um, again, a lot of the businesses, you know, some businesses did well. I mean, it's strangely enough, some businesses did well. It really depended on what their business was. Um, but again, restaurants, the hotel industry, those have been crushed really. Um, and so any PPP funding has been critical. Again, those were decisions whether to lay off employees or not lay off employees. I mean, if you have no revenue coming in, they had to make those decisions. And so that is critical. I know um, some recent legislation that was passed, the Restaurant Relief Act, um, maybe providing some grants for the restaurant industry. Again, we're all watching that now, waiting for a little bit more guidance. There's a shuttered venues um, grant program that came out. Again, important for um, you know museums, theaters, that industry, as well as the state grants, um, the Main Street Relief Program, for instance, those are all important. So really between New Hampshire's um, grant programs and the federal loans and grant programs, it was critical. I mean, it's almost honestly on a daily basis, we continue to watch that. Um, it's been difficult as Wendy mentioned, there's other credits, there's the employee retention credit. And so part of the challenge has been keeping up with all the legislation that continues to come out. Um, but it's something that has just been ongoing and I think probably will be ongoing through, I don't know, most of this year, just watching for that uh, relief and getting it to the clients as fast as we can. Uh, just a follow up. So the, the chamber is also connecting with the federal delegation, correct? In terms of how they're advocating for New Hampshire, our federal delegation in DC. Yeah, and that, Wendy, is that something you can speak to or? Uh, perhaps I could speak to it, Jim. Sure. Um, certainly, Representative Manchaputi, uh, connecting with all our legislative bodies is an important thing and maintaining re relationships for the chamber leadership to maintain relationships is something we look towards all the time. And we we're, we're, have good relationships, um, as you know, with all of our federal delegation. And probably maybe I, I can take one more question and, and then move it along. And so I'm looking this up as, as I see the, uh, the chat. So the question is, um, I believe you said that when property taxes are included in New Hampshire ranks number six, what are the five states ahead of New Hampshire? And so, right, so the climate, the, this, this um, overall ranking um, for the tax climate survey, again, obviously takes everything into account. Again, we have no sales tax and income tax. And so we come in overall, even though we may have you know, higher property taxes and higher business taxes, we come in at number six. Um, just for the perspective, I'm, I'm gonna read the list. Um, number five would be Montana. Number f you, so you can kind of see um, 
some of the common, commonalities here, but number five would be Montana. Number four is Florida. Number three is Alaska. Two is South Dakota. And number one is Wyoming. There's also a question here asking about, do we have a sense of the, uh, and, and Jim, I don't know if you have a sense on this or not, but um, on the implications of the proposed tax, tax cuts on cost shifting to towns. I know that's something we're always yeah, trying to pay attention that, to, but. Right, we've paid attention to it. I, I guess I couldn't probably answer that question. Right, um, it's always hard to know um, because then the town, cities and towns have to make their own decisions about how they handle their budgets. And it's an issue that we're, it's definitely an issue that we talk about um, yeah. and something that we're focused on. Um, and, but it's a really broad range of impacts um, but something that we want to delve into more deeply. Okay, I think I, that's it for me, Brian, and so happy to come back later if we have time. Great, thanks. Peggy? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Jim, for making what is often a confusing uh, jumble for many of us who are not in the business uh, more understandable, appreciate that. Um, next, we have Donna Gamash. Um, as you know, have heard that Donna is the Director of Government Affairs at Eversource. And Donna knows all things energy, believe me. You know, in fact, when I was uh, in the legislature, I struck a deal with Donna. I said, listen, Donna, if you help me understand the confusing world of energy, I will help you with the confusing world of healthcare. And um, I definitely got the, <laughs> the better end of that deal. But um, some of it is still a mystery, I have to admit. But not to Donna, she knows it all. So thanks, Donna, for your sponsorship and for being here to help us understand the impacts of energy legislation on our, our businesses in New Hampshire. Thank you, Peggy. I remember that deal. My eyes glaze over whenever anybody talks about health care. And I'm, I'm in awe of anybody who can understand it. So uh, good morning, everybody. It's good to see so many senators and legislators and Mayor Donchus this morning. And welcome, Wendy. We're really looking forward to working with you in your new role. For many of us, the most important thing, and for Peggy's benefit to know about energy, is that the lights turn on when we hit the switch. And we're warm when we turn up the thermostat. And after that, expect to, expectations vary, such as like, how is it produced? Um, how is it delivered? And how much it costs? These are topics that the legislature deals with every year and has been for many, many decades. Like your legislators, like your relationship with your constituents, our customers have very, very varied wants and needs also. And what we do know is that our customers want us to be a more sustainable company, employ the latest technology on our system, all while keeping costs as low as possible. We also know that some of our customers are willing to pay um, more for cleaner energy. And we know that some of our customers are not willing to pay even a little bit more. This chamber is made up of members who worry about their business futures and the costs as well. So that's why this issue is always a focus of the chamber's legislative work. And we're very grateful over the years to have partnered with the uh, Nashua Chamber on this really critical issue. And I have to say, even though for some energy is difficult, the Nashua Chamber and working with Peggy um, has, has made it a lot easier to work with the local legislators. So thank you for all the work you've done over the years. The legislators who deal with these issues agree in the legislature, agree on many of the very same goals. Even if they come from different philosophical points on the spectrum, what they don't agree on is how to get there. And we hope that our work in the legislature and with the Nashua Chamber helps to highlight ways to meet as many of those goals as possible. So this year, there have been a few interesting energy issues before the legislature. Oh, and, and by the way, I've been hearing for many years, like at the end of December every year, um, people will say, oh, Donna, this year is gonna be very quiet in energy, isn't it? And I haven't seen it yet. So uh, we, I heard that again for this year. So uh, many of you today are intimately familiar with what I'm gonna report out on, um, but for others of you, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. 
um, because if you don't follow it, it can be it can be um, yawning a bit. So House Bill 315 was a very controversial bill early in the session. And I might add also that um, I think I would say that the bills that we're talking about here, the Nashua Chamber, the Nashua area, very much affected by these bills. So that's why I chose these. House Bill 315, as I said, was very controversial early in the session. And it was originally intended to make corrections to existing statutes um, surrounding electricity aggregation and community power. It's a very complex topic, but it is a good example of how the stakeholders learned from each other and reached a compromise that garnered unanimous support um, in the committee. The chamber weighed in supporting a solution that brought the two sides together. Um, and I'm really excited to say that we did come together. And I do think that all sides learn from each other, which is good. We continue to learn every time we work with other stakeholders. So this bill is gonna be on the floor of the full house this week. So um, we expect it to pass, but hopefully it does, fingers crossed. Net metering is another issue that comes up year after year. It's also one where it appears that finally there is a compromise. Net metering comes in many, many different forms, but I do wanna begin by making sure everyone knows that any person, community or business can install uh, their own means of generating electricity at any time, as long as the interconnections are worked out with the utility. The issue at hand with net metering is the ability to provide incentives to those who do so within specific boundaries of the law. And this year, Senate Bill 109 is the target bill that would expand the limits on the incentives um, only to communities who wish to participate as a way to help lower um, energy, local energy costs. This bill uh, seems to be supported by most, yet I think the bill, it was tabled last week in the Senate, will be added either to another House bill that comes over or to the budget as a way to keep um, the language as close to the sponsor's intent as possible. So we do hope that passes uh, and we think it would be good for all the communities. And we know that Nashua is very, very much impacted by that bill. So hopefully it stays together. And finally, I would just like to mention the proposed creation of a Department of Energy. The governor included this proposal in his budget and it's now before the, it's going before the full legislature, full house this week. We know that it has been a topic of interest to many um, who care about energy. It's been going on, the discussion has been kind of going on for, for many, many years now. And there are a few different governmental offices that deal with energy. And the goal is to streamline these uh, offices, to streamline the process, keep it budget neutral, and uh, make it clear that there's a bright red line between those who advocate for different policies and those who issue the orders. We're neutral on the proposal, but we can see that there are some changes needed if it does pass in order to, for those goals to be achieved and in order for the utilities to operate in a way that's legal and necessary. So we're, we're very heartened that um, the legislators and the governor's staff is very open to the changes that the utilities might bring forward. All the utilities are working together to put to, to, to compile a final list of, of you know, what would make it um, uh, more legal and more easy to, to work through. So we're gonna be sharing that during the Senate process. So um, that's a big deal. I think it's a really big deal. And if it's all worked out together and comes together um, in a way that works, I think it would probably be good for New Hampshire. Let's just fingers crossed that it does work out that way. Those are just some of the key issues, energy issues in the 2021 legislator, legislature. Luckily for us, there are some very capable legislators who serve on both the House and Senate Energy Committees and a few of you are here today. So we're very grateful for your work and commitment and we're thankful to this chamber for its work in this very complex world of energy. So thank you for the opportunity to share our thoughts this morning. Um, thanks, Donna. Are there any questions in the chat, Wendy or? Uh... Brian? Um, I haven't seen any about energy, but let's, uh, I'll wait a second here to see if um, anything pops in. And, and certainly we can come back to that if, um, to, uh, we can come back to that if, if we, uh, if someone does come up. But, um, you know, I guess I'll just talk about how, um, you know, we do cover a number of, uh, of different topic areas. And it, and I think it's important for everyone to to remember that the Chamber's vision is of a broad, vibrant, diverse, thriving Greater Nashville community recognized locally, nationally, and internationally as an attractive region to live, work, raise a family, and build a business. And 
we strive on a nonpartisan basis to advocate for public policy that supports our mission of the chamber being a primary catalyst for the success of greater Nashua's diverse business community. And we're, you know, we have to understand that we compete. <laughs> That's cute, Peggy. <laughs> um, that we compete on a, uh, for both customers and employees uh, beyond our New Hampshire borders. Um, so we, you know, regionally and, uh, you know, we have a customer that, that we compete with basically to try and make sure they keep their work here in Southern New Hampshire instead of in Ohio, as an example. Um, and with COVID-19 and, and the work from home environment, you know, it really creates uh, a number of different uh, new opportunities and, and issues to deal with um, on this whole work from home environment. So in addition to tax and energy policy, we also follow labor um, and workforce housing um, and a number of and, and bills like that. Now with the, the way the session worked this year, a lot of those things were tabled, um, uh, re-referred. So, you know, there, we haven't had to deal with them as much and we'll be continuing to focus on the, on the budget as one of the, the, one of the key things. But, you know, you know, House Bill 113 is something we're still following. Um, which calls for the payment of unearned, of earned but unused vacation uh, or personal time. And, um, you know, we just feel that paid time off is a benefit measured in time, um, not in cash. Um, and we feel like it's a decision to pay out PTO should remain at the discretion of the employee, of the employer. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and on the workforce housing front, critical for New Hampshire, we have um, also oppose House Bill 288 because it would repeal uh, the Housing Appeals Board. And we feel like that's um, something that should be given an opportunity to, to see how it, it, it can uh, and work. Um, and we also uh, advocate for, you know, not only our for-profit business members, but our non-profit business members. And um, Mike Affelberg, um, wanted to comment on a piece of le legislation uh, on behalf of uh, a lot of our nonprofit members. Uh, Mike, you want to comment on that? Where'd he go? Hey, Brian, I'm actually driving in my car, so I tried to put as much of the comment as possible into the okay. chat itself. If that's possible, just to read it, uh, HB 626, I think most people are fairly familiar with this, perhaps some not, and it relates to historic horse racing and charitable gaming. Right. And that House Bill 626, which I believe is also supported by uh, the city of Nashua, um, would allow for the um, uh, adding of historic horse racing as well, and as a way to just continue to help the nonprofits who were definitely hurt um quite a bit uh, during covid-19 so it's just an example of another piece of legislation and and not only our for profit members but our nonprofit members that we try and advocate for um representative manjapuri lathi do you have a question about interconnectivity yes i wanted to ask donna gamaj uh can you just highlight one aspect of the interconnectivity currently is limited to 100 kilowatt. Uh, is there any, when you talk about the changes, is there any opportunity to discuss with the utilities, with the local generation? Uh, there's no uh, limit on interconnectivity. There's no, um, the interconnectivity is separate from the incentives that are that net metering provides so um, you can you just have to work with the utilities and um, you know and and really the reason you have to work with the utilities is because they just need to make sure that the system can take that back and forth power and working with the developer um, you know they would have to just pay the cost the additional cost to the system um, and outside of that the you know up to 100 kilowatts is you know the, the largest incentive between 100 kilowatts and one megawatt it it's less of an incentive 
and Senate Bill 109 moves that one megawatt to five megawatts. So um, I hope that helps. That's simply put. Thank you. That You're welcome. Uh, and there's also a question about, you know, how do how do we feel about um, the teaching of div divisive issues? Um, I would say that, you know, one of the things is a real goal of the chamber this year is to increase the diversity of our membership. And, um, you know, we, I think New Hampshire can pride itself on being one of the more civil states <laughs> in our country. And, uh, you know, we would certainly always be an advocate of uh, civil uh, discussion. I think it's a great, you know, Senator Morris talked about how our Senate, as an example, um, works well together um, across the aisle, and we would support um, those types of initiatives and would oppose any type of divisive conversations. Um, let's see, I'm trying to read some more of the chat. Um, Jim, I, um, it's difficult to, um, but maybe you want to touch on, you know, the, the difference between being 41st in business taxes, but sixth in overall taxes. I don't know if you can touch on that again. Yeah, so this is, I've heard this question many times, and it's a good question, honestly. From what I've heard over the years um, is, is kind of suggested here that there's many reasons why a business would want to come to New Hampshire. Taxes isn't the, certainly not the only issue. It's taxes, infrastructure, education, um, housing. There's many, many factors that come into a decision, and taxes is an important piece, though, of that. Um, and you're right, overall, we do very well, um, which is important. Again, um, not only does the business have to be located to New Hampshire, but their employees would come to New Hampshire as well. And so the overall ranking is great that we are so high. I guess my comment about being low, why that's still important um, is, um, one, I would say we should always be striving to do what we can to minimize the business tax rate, to, just period, to help businesses generally. And so we should always try to um, be mindful of where we are and what, if anything, we can do to reduce the um, business tax rates. And then also I've heard that um, that some businesses kind of use it as a checklist. And so when the state of New Hampshire goes out, um, you know, if a company in Texas or wherever is looking at New Hampshire, um, they do see that we are uh, high with respect to overall taxes, but if they're strictly going down some kind of checklist and we're number 41st with regards to business taxes, it is what it is. It just kind of reflects that fact. And so um, it's something that, again, we, should, we just should continue to watch. Um, and again, it's one piece to the puzzle, I, I would say. Thank you, Jim. All right. Um, I don't see any more questions, I don't think, in the chat. Um, and I'm sure, you know, uh, an hour plus in on a Monday morning, we're all somewhat getting a little bit zoomed out. <laughs> um, but I really do appreciate uh, so many people coming in. Um, Amber, okay, that's a good question. I'm not sure if there's anyone on here that can address it, but if they can, um, talking about the SBDC funding has been reduced to zero. Can we anticipate full support of restoring this? Um, you know, we're certainly supportive of that. We feel like it is now back, um, if I remember correctly. I don't know if there's anyone I, on. I can on comment the, on that. Yeah. Um, the SPD, the House restored 225, um, 225,000 per year into the budget. It's about half of what SBDC normally gets. Speaking from a chamber perspective, I can tell you um, as it passes over into the Senate that uh, half the budget is not going to cut it for the services that they provide. And I say this as a chamber president um, coming from my past mm -hmm. chamber. 
the the there is no replacement in the private or public sector that does the business counseling and advising done by SBDC. And to tell you that when people, especially go, during, going through COVID, when their businesses shut down, they couldn't get through to a bank, they couldn't get through the SBA, they could get through the SBDC and they became their clients. Also the webinars that they have created, uh, have been lifesavers to many. I can't. I. I can't. I cannot tell you how helpful the SBDC was um, in the time of need for the businesses in this state. Um, and I think if you look for the report, the return on investment of what eight hundred thousand or so in, in the budget, the the millions, the hundreds of millions. I think it's one hundred and sixty million dollars was the turnaround. It's it's a cheap investment in the long run. Um, I should say I am on their board, but prior to their board, um, I'm newly on their board. I was a huge um, fan of SBDC, and I hope the Senate will add some money back into their budget. Yes, um, and uh, other folks have chimed in in, in, in agreement. And uh, you know, Will Craig, who is a great new member of our board, um, it has also been heavily involved in SBDC, I believe. And, and so we have a lot of support and, um, and I'm glad folks uh, brought that up again this morning. And I will add, Brian, that uh, the, the Greater Nashua Chamber uh, talked and wrote a very strong letter uh, mm -hmm. in, in support of returning funding because of the importance that Wendy just referenced. And lastly, yes, we always support rail, um, but it's one of, you know, it's actually interesting. I think it was you or someone else mentioned, um, you know, our connection with the federal delegation. And I've long been a proponent of saying that, you know, we have to be ready for when the federal money comes um, because the federal money is really what's going to make uh, commuter rail come to New Hampshire with so much of the infrastructure improvements and the operating aspects of commuter rail lying in Massachusetts. Um, it really has to be a, a joint uh, effort and it's, you know, we can't really do it on our own. And so we really need that federal support in order to make that happen. And I'm glad uh, and hoping that maybe as part of all what's happening right now, um, that that will be part of it. Um, would you believe that this is the time for a multimodal uh, infrastructure and especially prime time for uh, rail and last mile connectivity coming as a package into New Hampshire? We have to work together with the delegation in local, both Na Nashua and Manchester plays a very key role in terms of being the two largest cities and the hole in the middle Absolutely. I mean, we're this whole corridor, um, Salem, Manchester, Nashua, you know, the economic drivers for the whole state. Um, and there's just so many aspects of commuter rail that, um, that drive economic development for the whole state. Um, I can't remember exactly where I saw this, but there was a um, Amtrak laid out a whole map of the country that showed areas that they're going to be either increasing or adding service and the whole the, the corridor up through Manchester um, was on that map so um, that's very positive yeah Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the members of our advocacy committee uh, who come together on cold Monday mornings in January, February, March to um, to review and, and pour over all of the legislation that comes through uh, every year. Um, I would love to have a broader rep representation of our membership base. Uh, so please reach out to me or the chamber office if you would like to join our advocacy committee. Um, I'd like to thank Preddy Strategies who's joined us this year uh, appreciate their support um, as both uh, providing guidance and also being a, uh, a sponsor of what we do uh, to our legislators for your service to our state and for taking the time to join us today. And thank you for the members who joined us today. And last but not least, 
thank you to our sponsors, uh, BAE and Eversource. Our chamber couldn't do the work they do without you. Please keep reading The Advocate every Friday, and we look forward to seeing you in, the, in person in the months to come. In the meantime, be safe, mask up, and enjoy your Monday. Wendy, I don't know if you had